Okay, so we're gonna start off in this video with shoulder flexion range of motion, and then we will move on to MMT. So shoulder flexion happens in the sagittal plane, the end feel is firm, and the normal value is zero to 180 degrees. So the patient position is supine with the palm facing the body. And I'm gonna stand, I'm gonna measure her left shoulder, so I'm standing on the left side. And I'm gonna say, I want you to bring your arm up overhead as far as it'll go. And here's what I want you to notice. I want you to see that the pillow is impeding her range of motion. So bring your arm back down. So what you wanna do before you even begin is you wanna move the pillow out to the side so that it's still supporting her head, but it's not in the way of her shoulder motion. So I'm gonna have you do that same motion again, bring your arm up overhead as far as it'll go. Okay, so the technically, if you go back down, I might have you do this a few times. Technically the textbook says a chromium process is your axis of motion. However, when someone flexes, the acromion process disappears, watch. Go ahead, do. It's way over there, there's no way that I can see that. So imagine that this is a robot, right? Where's her axis of motion happening? It's pretty much right in the armpit there. Um, the stationary arm is aligned with the lateral midline of the thorax. So many people, and you can see here, there's an arch in her back, right? So we don't say to the person, do that again without arching your back. We just accommodate for that. So you take like the highest point of the arch and you ignore everything distal to it. And we're gonna make sure that the stationary arm, this black line is parallel with this line here. And then the moving arm goes to the lateral epicondyle of the humerus. So I palpate that, line that up. And so I'm reading 173 degrees. It is really important when you're measuring shoulder flexion that you realize that anything on this side is gonna be less than 180, hypomobile and anything on this side is hypermobile, of course, if we're measuring the left shoulder. So you've gotta become really um, familiar with your goni because the difference, if, if we're measuring, let's say cervical flexion and you measure 50 and your proctor measures 52, it's not a big deal. But if with shoulder flexion, you're measuring 179 and your proctor's reading the goni as 181, those two degrees are significantly different because it means you're not understanding which direction you're reading the goniometer from. So if you have any questions, come to me and we'll talk about it. Um, okay, bring your arm down. There are a couple other things I wanted to talk about with flexion. Make sure that when you're measuring flexion, your goniometer's in the sagittal plane because one of the common errors we see is that someone will have someone, in this case, flex and they'll forget because this looks very much like the end range for abduction and then they'll have the goniometer here in the frontal plane. So make sure your goniometer's in the sagittal plane. Don't, don't move. There are two other things I wanted to mention that I don't wanna forget. Oh, okay, um, one other thing. So the patient is supine. The patient is not in hook line because if she were to get into hook line, you can go ahead and get into hook line. What that does is it puts the, dis, the distal end or the origin of latissimus dorsi on stretch and latissimus dorsi crosses that low back and also the shoulder. So now if she were to flex her shoulder, potentially we could see less range of motion and that's more of a measurement of latissimus dorsi flexibility than it is for actual range of motion at the shoulder. Okay, so now I'm gonna have you sit in this wooden chair because we're gonna do MMT. Okay, so when we do MMT for shoulder flexion, they're sitting in a chair, the arm will be by your side, and you're gonna bring your arm up, palm facing the floor, just up to shoulder level. So they don't need to go through their full available range of motion for a grade three. They only need to go through 90 degrees from their side up to 90 degrees. So she goes through her full range of motion, not through her full range, through the full range that I've given her, the 90, then that's a three. If she was only able to, if she was able to do more than half, but more than half but not the full 90, we'd call that a three minus. And if she was able to come up a little bit but not even half, we would call that a two plus. Okay, but she did her three, so now I'm gonna provide resistance. So my resistance hand is on the distal humerus, just proximal to the elbow. I'm not wrapping around, I'm not being tactilely confusing, it's just my palm. My stabilization hand is ipsilateral shoulder at the top. 
and I'm gonna say, I'm gonna try to push your arm back down. Don't let me do it, stay strong. And then I'm gonna push. There's my four and five. Depending on your strength, your height, the height of your partner, I could stand on a footstool so that I have better leverage to push. And so we did three, four, five. Two is partial range. And if I'm gonna palpate to distinguish between a one and a zero, I'm gonna palpate on the anterior shoulder because that's where our shoulder flexors are. And I would say, try to bring your arm up and if she can't do it, but I'm feeling anything under here, I would give her a one and nothing, I'm giving her a zero. Before you turn that off, let me make sure there were no other things I wanted to say about the MMT. Oh, the only thing I did not mention is if someone's lacking shoulder flexion, they might compensate with trunk extension. So if you see that trunk extension, you would give verbal cues, maybe some tactile cues posteriorly to minimize that. And that's it.